Hi, I'm Rolf Klesen. I'm patent attorney in Germany, and today I'm interviewing Russ Krajek. Russ Krajek is a recovering patent attorney who believes that IP can be used as a financial instrument. He is the author of Investing in Patents and one of AIAM's top 300 patent strategists. He is the CEO of Blue Iron LLC, and he is a practicing patent attorney as well as a wholesale and retail insurance broker specializing in intellectual property insurance. Welcome to the show, Russ. It's good to be here. It's nice to finally meet you. I know we've I've seen you around the internet for a long time, but we've never spoken. It's good to chat. Yes, yes. I also recognized your name before you. I got the email from you, but uh, yeah, we never really met. I think, although we studied in very nearby locations. You studied in <laughs> Rensselaer, and I studied SUNY Albany. So like only like I think three miles away yeah. or something or five. I yeah, don't know. Like ships passing in the night. You know? <laughs> All right, so so you are using patents as a financial tool for business, and that's uh, one of your main topics. But before we jump into that, um, I wanted to pick your brain about something related and maybe leading to that. Um, what, in your opinion, are the most common mistakes people make when getting patents? And what are the most common myths about patents in your view? Um, you know, I, I think the biggest mistake that a lot of entrepreneurs and and CEOs make is that there's this disconnect between oh I have a patent and I'm protected oh and yes you you see a lot of it especially in the startup world where an entrepreneur is pitching their idea and then some angel investor says oh do you have a patent on that and the entrepreneur says yes and then the angel investor mentally checks a block oh this is going to be a good one <laughs> um but it, there's a big difference between just having a shiny plaque on the wall and being protected and once you kind of get under the covers behind it and, and start looking at well what makes a patent valuable or not valuable you find out that you know very few of these patents have real intrinsic value and when you when you when you start with the notion of how do i create value with this asset and how do i reverse engineer the patent system well then there's a, a whole bunch of things that kind of pop out of the woodwork that are commonly you know the the best practices that a lot of people preach that may or may not actually be good for the companies mm -hmm. And most of the patents that are filed and granted are not used in litigation in their whole lifetime. So like only a very small most fraction like, of patents are actually used in litigation. So yeah, yeah maybe 2%. Right. Yes. So, so that's one uh, out of 50. Right. <laughs> are actually used in litigation. So, you know, I, I got 50 to one odds that this patent will never matter. Right. And so why am I doing it? Right. So that's a very important question, especially small uh, companies, startup companies have to answer because, you know, larger firms, they have a larger briefcase and they can afford filing all these patents. But <laughs> as a smaller firm, you really have to look whether you need a patent. And you mentioned an important point. I think investors are really uh, attracted by uh, startups having patents or patent applications. Uh, not understanding the concept sometimes at all, but <laughs> well, they're attracted to the the dream of oh, this thing's going to be a home run, right? Right. They're attracted to the to to that. I don't know. They're attracted to to the I don't know. Greed is the right word, but but they want it. They really want this thing to succeed, right? And so if they can envision the thing blowing up and being humongous that's what gets them excited right so um when i when i introduced you i said you are using patents as a financial tool and that's basically your main topic uh, today um mm -hmm. so what do you mean by using patents as a financial tool for business well uh, my core i didn't uh, I don't like the inherent conflict of interest between the patent attorney and the client. And, you know, the, a lot of people are not there, not that familiar with it, but 
if you go to a patent attorney, it's kind of like asking the barber if you need a haircut. Like you're going to get one. And um, I <laughs> wanted to flip that on its head. And so I provide financing for patents. And if I finance a patent, I'm saying to the client, hey, you can walk away from the patent at any time before you pay for it, and I'll take it. I will take that patent and, you know, I, I will build the patent so that I think I can license it or sell it or monetize or whatever. But it puts the emphasis on me to create a good asset. Now, when I do that, I typically buy an insurance policy so, the, so that the company has the ability to enforce the patent. And if if the, if the company grows to have some decent revenue and they have some decent IP, we can even do loans, pretty substantial loans, like up to 50 million using patents as collateral. And, and you know, that whole, all those things are talking about patents having real value to a company. A lot of times when you go talk to a startup company or even a gigantic corporation, and they they think of patents as an expense. Oh, I have to pay the patent attorney for this. Oh, I have to pay the patent attorney for that. Oh, I'm going to get a big bill for this. And $400 an hour, $800 an hour, whatever they're paying, they look at patents as an expense. When you flip that narrative and you start talking about these assets as having real financial value, you think about, hey, we're going to create some assets that we can borrow $50 million against. Mm -hmm. And that's a whole different conversation with the client. That's how can you and I create value together? And how do I, as an attorney, add value to your company? And let's measure that. And let's put it in front of you. And you are thinking about having real assets, financial, you know, put it in a financial context as opposed to, well, I got, I got these really shiny plaques on the wall. So you're saying you are actually paying for the prosecution of the patents that you get engaged with? We pay for, the, for the, all the filing costs, all the prosecution costs, the filing fees and all that. And essentially the clients get to pay for the patents after they issue. Mm -hmm. so, so what is the model? Like, how does that work? Like, how do you finance the patents? What is your return basically? When do you get, when, how do you recover your costs? <laughs> well, you know, it's not done for free. You know, obviously there's, um, but it, it's, it, we defer the cost. Essentially we do a loan that collateralizes the asset and the loan becomes due when the patents issue. Mm -hmm. So by doing that, we get paid after the patent issues and, and we take the risk on whether or not the, the, the patent's any good. Mm -hmm. So um, will you become the stakeholder in the patent or do you hold the so patent? We, no? we do it two different ways. Mm -hmm. In one way, we can do a security interest mm -hmm. on, the, on the patents or in the other way, we can create a holding company and transfer the assets to the holding company. Mm -hmm. From a con and, and the client gets an exclusive license with a buyout option. The only reason why we do a holding company is that all the income from a holding company is taxed at uh, long-term capital gains. Mm -hmm. And if I do the exact same contract but use a security interest, all the interest is taxed at ordinary income. Mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe that maybe the tax laws will change, so that doesn't matter, but at least today, that that's the only structural difference. And so do you also profit from, uh, basically when the patents are granted, do you also actively seek licenses from licensees? Or no, the, like... the, the client, it, they're the inventor. Mm -hmm. It's The patent is, they have an exclusive license. They can do with it what they want. Right. They can license it out for a dollar. They could license it out for a million dollars. I, you yeah. know, it's their asset, and I have no say in that. They have complete control of the asset, just like when you're a patent attorney and you do a patent for a client. They do with it what they want. 
Right. And this is no different from leasing a car versus paying cash for it. Still your car, you drive it where you want, you do what you want with it. Mm. So um, I'm just, be before we talked, um, I thought about how your business model is different from NPEs, non-practicing entities like intellectual ventures or so on. Yeah. But they are actively pursuing licenses or litigating patents to, let's say, generate license fees or other people would say extort uh, license fees. Um, but but that's different from your model, as I understand it. The, the... Well, that's also, they're also downstream. Yeah, right. You know, I'm trying to create the assets with the inventors, with the company that's that's bringing the product to market and kind of, you know, if you want to know one thing that people do that's a mistake when it comes to patents, is that they get a patent too early. If I'm going to invest in a patent and, you know, and the only collateral I'm going to take is a patent, the thing that I'm worried about is will people buy the product? Mm. It's not, oh, hey, I have this great idea on, you know, some kind of a Hyperloop, Maglev, whatever thing. Well, that's a great idea, but when's it going to get commercialized? I need to do patents that are really going to get commercialized. So mm -hmm. when I'm involved in doing the financing, I'm looking at the company and saying, do you guys have enough assets to get the product to market? Do you have a good marketing strategy do you have enough inventory can does the thing actually work you know i'm i'm asking the questions like an investor as opposed to just you know did the check clear right um maybe it's it would be easier for the listeners to understand uh, your model or your business better when you maybe do, do you have like an example where like um can you share like a story where that where you helped like a, a mm -hmm. startup company to be successful and to um, leverage their IP? You know, I've done a, probably I don't know a, a dozen or two deals so far. Some of these companies uh, um, are are still plugging away, and uh, I wrote the original patent for, for the inventor. Um, early on, I liked I liked the idea. I liked where where he was going with it. He was able to get some funding. He was able to I was going to say monetize, but he was able to get some investors and merged with another company that is that is is just on the verge of commercializing the product. And this is a medical a medical device company. Um, I thought the the invention on its own had some value, but I really was intrigued by the inventor's enthusiasm for it and very compelling mm -hmm. and still remains remains to this day. Now, um, they have not yet exited, but they're, you know, they're still working their way. They've got FDA approval. Their, their, their biggest problem is about getting inventory and and shipping product i mean that's <laughs> but that's a you know a, a much more well-defined product or problem than will this thing even work does anybody want it so it's yeah um sometimes i've done it i've actually done it for publicly traded companies where they essentially need in-house patent counsel um in-house counsel are the ones who are going to live with the patents as opposed to outside counsel who they get paid to create the patents in-house pat in-house counsel are the ones that have to you know answer to the board why did we spend all this money and show you know realize the value out of it so the, the in-house counsel is thinking about it from a business standpoint outside counsel is you know, doing the job of filing the patents, getting through the patent office, you know, complying with all the regulations and such. But the in-house guys are really the ones that are thinking about the, the long-term strategy. And because, because we finance the patents, because we treat them as collateral, I'm forced to think about them in a different way than I am if I'm just outside counsel. 
And that's really what I mean by being a recovering patent attorney. <laughs> Right. I was actually a little bit envious when I heard your story uh, and read about you because um, I'm a European and a German patent attorney. And in Germany, I'm actually not allowed to um, have a commercial business like um, insurance broking or something like that or broking mm -hmm. like financial advising or these kinds of things. And at the same time, being a patent attorney, um, I'm not allowed to. So. Um, that's very interesting to see that you are in the US, you can actually combine these activities. Well, in the US, and, if hmm. I'm the attorney, I mm -hmm. have that fiduciary responsibility to advise them. And, and if I'm wrong, it's malpractice and I get sued. So, this, you know, I have to be very careful about how I advise people. And, um, but in a financing relationship, it's actually a, a different kind of transaction. Typically, I represent a holding company which owns the patents, and my job as a patent attorney is to represent the best interest of the patents themselves. Mm -hmm. And then I have a contractual relationship with, with the client. And so I am not acting as their attorney. I'm acting as their, as their business partner, joint venture, um, company. So in that way, I, I am, you know, I, I'm, I'm dealing with that issue that you're talking about, um, the prohibition of taking equity and all that kind of thing that, um, right. you guys have as well. It's probably expressed differently in Germany, but it's, you know, same basic concept. Okay. It's a conflict of interest. Yes. Okay. Uh, interesting. So maybe I should look more closely. Maybe it's possible to have some kind of this business model in Europe as well. <laughs> I have to have a look. <laughs> Possible. Yeah. So um, before the interview, you told me also about the in importance of insurance uh, in the field of IP. And most legal mm -hmm. ins cost insurances for businesses do not cover the costs for IP. And in some or, or most of them are explicitly excluding the risk from IP conflicts. Right. So what are your thoughts about this? So where does where do you come into the play <laughs> into the game? So I you know I came into the insurance bit kind of as a it seemed like a good product for you know if I'm if I'm if I'm part of a you know if I'm financing a patents for a startup company my biggest risk is that well I mean I shouldn't say my biggest but one risk that I have is that somebody will start infringing these patents. And the, these are patents that I'm collateralizing for my, you know, I'm doing it myself, but I'm mm -hmm. treating them as collateral. What happens if somebody does infringe? What happens if Samsung or Apple or Google or whoever is like infringing? What do we do? Well, that's something that can be insured. And I had no idea until maybe a couple of years ago that patent insurance even existed. I'd been in the patent right. bit for 20 years or so. Not and very well no known. Idea. Yeah. And um, the cool thing is that you can, you can buy enforcement insurance. You can buy defense insurance. Right. Um, kind of the most famous case. I don't know if you recall, there's a case called Octane Fitness that went to the US Supreme Court a few years ago. They, they were a small company, they got sued by a troll, but Octane Fitness had an insurance policy. And Octane Fitness could have just rolled over to the troll, paid them the whatever damages they wanted and moved on, but Octane Fitness had an insurance policy. And they said, you know what, let's fight it. It doesn't cost us money out of pocket. We're on an insurance policy, so we can make the best decision for our company. And Octane Fitness sued the troll, invalidated the patent, went to the Supreme Court and back completely on an insurance policy. Cool. So they didn't have, you know, they had what copay or whatever, you know, they have their piece of it, but the huge burden of 
three, four, five million dollars to go to the Supreme Court and back, all on an insurance policy. And Octane Fitness lived to be acquired by Nautilus Fitness Company, you know, for several hundred million dollars. And, you know, that was kind of the the greatest success of the IP industry, but it or at least IP insurance. The thing for a patent attorney, if I'm talking to a client and, and they're they're in to get a patent and I'm like, well, do you have insurance for this patent? Well, no, that you're just talking about one more, you know, one more expense that I, you know, that, so they hate <laughs> you even more. But if they think about it, if you start talking to them in terms of we can insure this asset and it's a, an insurable asset, they start thinking about it differently. And especially if you're at a firm that does patent prosecution as well as litigation, if I'm the if I'm the partner and I got and and my client has insurance and somebody infringes, well then they could come back to the law firm on an insurance policy, basically with you know you can spend up to two million dollars on this. I mean, wouldn't that be great for a law firm? Wouldn't yeah. it be great to be having the conversation of, hey, let's do everything we can to enforce this patent. Money doesn't matter. We can spend what we need. We can do a really good job at this instead of nickel and diming. Hey, you know, you're running low on your uh, on your retainer. Can you keep it up? And you know, and they're all hand wringing about how much is it costing. Take that off the table. Make let them let the client you know, spend what needs to be spent, give them the freedom to do that. And insurance is part of the story for, for, um, for the patent attorney to talk to the client, thinking about how valuable is this asset to them and how this is going to work out. And, and you have, you know, you're not going to go broke on, on a lawsuit. Um, it's a great thing for the patent attorney because it brings in more revenue to the firm. Um, and it's a great thing for a client because it's, it differentiates them, especially for smaller companies when they're, they're out talking to investors and, hey, I got this big patent portfolio. And uh, you know, the investors say, well, how much is that costing you per year? And yeah, hey, look, it's, it's insured, right? Right. When all the big companies start infringing, we got them, right? And we have we have the means to to uh, go after them. So uh, I like flipping that conversation. I like having the the conversation of we're creating value and and how to make that happen with the clients. And especially in your model, where you are actually taking the risk in getting the patent granted. Um, mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, once you uh, use the patent in litigation, uh, there's always a chance that the patent gets uh, revocation action or something. Right. And um, when you are taking that risk, uh, you want to make sure that it's insured. <laughs> sure. Probably. And, and, yeah. and you know what? The, 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 the CEO of the company the the angel investor, the venture investor, anybody who's associated with that company wants it to be insured too. Right. You know, what would be worse than having the killer patent that, that some big company infringes and you don't have the, you don't have the wherewithal to go after them. Right. You're afraid that you're going to bankrupt the company in a lawsuit. So you don't yeah. touch it. Yeah, actually, um, myself included, uh, a lot of patent attorneys advise the clients do not start lawsuits in the US because they are so damn expensive. <laughs> Try to avoid them at all costs. But uh, basically, you're saying no, just get insurance. <laughs> well, you know, I don't insurance doesn't solve all the problems, but it certainly changes right. the conversation from right. this is going to be a $5 million investment. Right. By, by the company, a bet the farm, you know, bet the company level investment to it's insured, you know, we're not using our own capital to go after this. Right. 
So you had some really interesting ideas and um, thought provoking, provoking ideas, uh, some, and I am guessing the listeners and viewers of uh, they are interested in finding more, uh, finding out more about you. So where can people find about find more about you? So where do oh, you want a, to send them? There's a few different ways. Um, first, you know, I, I'm pretty easy to find on LinkedIn. Uh, feel free to connect with me there. Um, my website is blueironip.com, B-L-U-E-I-R-O-N-I-P.com, or ip.insure, which is kind of the insurance side of the business. Um, I also have a podcast called Patent Myths, and um, which is a little bit provocative. We talk about how provisional patents are always the wrong thing and so on, you know i agree go against, <laughs> <laughs> go against the conventional wisdom in a lot of in a lot of things um yeah i also have a book called investing in patents which is available on amazon or you know truth be told if anybody sent me their you know sent me an email and asked nicely i'll be happy to sign and send them a copy so um <laughs> thank you so yes, thank you very much for for your thoughts and uh, for spending your time uh, with me. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Oh, I enjoyed it. It's a lot of, it's, um, I'm glad I finally got to meet you. <laughs> yes. All right. Thank you very much.